Hello and welcome to the Alatea Foundation podcast. My name is Stephen Cole. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Mr. Saad Rahim to the podcast. Mr. Rahim is chief economist at the Trafigora Group, a Singapore-based multinational commodity trading company, which was founded in 1993. Just very briefly, a little bit of background on the group. Uh, It trades in base metals and energy. It is the world's largest private metals trader and second largest oil trader, having built or, or bought stakes in pipelines, mines, smelters, and ports. So, Mr. Saad Rahim, a warm welcome to the Alatea Foundation podcast. Thank you so much, Stephen. A real pleasure to be here. Well, to begin with, when you're not traveling the globe several times over, can you (laughs) describe for us the day-to-day life of an LNG trader? It it must be a a little more complicated than the old trope, buy low, sell high. (laughs) <laughs> a little bit, but uh, actually in many ways, uh, what we do as physical commodity traders is we always sort of describe it. It's almost the oldest business there is in the sense of it is about delivering an agreed upon quantity of an agreed good at a certain location at a certain time for a certain price, right? Is you want to buy some uh, barrels of crude oil or diesel or gasoline, or you want to buy some tons of metal you want to buy a cargo of LNG, okay, well, then we will help source that from the producers and then uh, arrange the transport logistics. Really, I mean, at the heart of it, we're a logistics company to then deliver it to the end user or into storage until such time as it may be needed. So when you say the word trader, a lot of people will sometimes think in, you know, I think even before I joined Trafigura, uh, you know, you would think it's a lot of people sitting in front of uh, Bloomberg screens you know, or trading away. Up on the stock room floor, waving papers. Yes, exactly, exactly. But it's it's much more about the you know going and and uh, meeting people, you know, creating these relationships, really figuring out the details, shipping, insurance, you know, all of those things along the chain. A lot of which you know can can be a lot less exciting, I think, than than some of those uh, you know the the themes that people have in their head. But really about things that are that are meant to keep the global economy moving you know, if you will, and, and, and kind of operating. Oh, well, that, that's great. That's very, very clear indeed. It, it could be argued, Saad, there are only four major LNG trading companies in the world. Trafigura, Vittel, Gunvor and Glencore. Is, is, is that number enough to give the market sufficient liquidity? I mean, I think it is so far. We haven't really had any, any major issues. I mean, we have, this has been obviously a very unusual year because of what's been happening with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the volatility that has created, in particular as gas flows from Russia to Europe have been reduced. Um, But, you know, the market is still working as it should. Um, And you can see that in the fact that now Europe actually has enough gas for this winter, other than perhaps the most extreme weather scenario that one can imagine. But even for next winter, and, you know, and that is the market functioning as it should, you know, it does mean that we have seen higher prices as a result, but that again, ultimately is a function of, of a market working. We're saying, okay, well, this place has a higher need and a higher ability to pay for this LNG, you know, with, namely being Europe, and that you know, we're going to attract that LNG then from other markets to put it into Europe. Um, you know, so really it's it's provided enough flexibility enough liquidity i mean more than are there enough traders i would argue you know is there enough uh kind of flex in the system and we say this across commodities really if we look at oil we look at metals you know we are very very tight on on spare capacity across all these markets you know there isn't a lot of flexibility in the system a lot of that is due to years of underinvestment um you know and uh and and companies you know, and I think responding to what their their stakeholders, their shareholders really want, which is returning money back to them in the form of dividends or buybacks rather than investing in new capacity and, and, and all of that. So, you know, it is this, this tug of war between those two things. And I think we've seen some of that this year. But overall, I think the system has been working as, as it should. Uh, that's, that's great to hear and reassuring too, certainly for people you know, with this winter. Uh, toll processing appears mm-hmm. to be a process more common in the US than in other LNG producing uh, countries or companies. Tell us, uh, describe what is toll processing and why is it unique to the US? And is it something that LNG traders uh, take part in? 
So I think the, 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 what you're describing there with toll processing really is about saying, well, instead of traditional LNG, it tends to be sold on a long-term contract indexed usually to Brent or some derivative of, of crude oil and saying, okay, as a percentage of, of this over some time period, right? Tolling will tell me effectively that there is, uh, you know, whatever Henry Hub is, because this is a U.S. based, so Henry Hub is the main U.S. benchmark, right? So Henry Hub plus a fixed tolling fee, right? So call it two dollars in some cases, right? Um, and and that's really for the for the facility, right? And to say, and the difference is, as you allude to, why is this only happening in the U.S.? Well, the U.S. is really the only place where you can effectively just buy the gas off the grid, right? Rather than in traditionally upstream, uh, LNG projects are tied to an upstream development, right? So you have a gas deposit, a gas reservoir, then you are going to develop that upstream project and build an LNG uh, facility tied specifically to that reserve, right? But because of the US's unique nature, partly because it has so much gas in the form of shale, and because it has such a widespread system, the interconnected uh, you know, pipelines and everything else, you, what you have seen is projects being built without an upstream component, which is unique, right? Because it's effectively saying, well, we're just, we're just investing in the liquefaction facility and everything else related to it, but not taking any upstream risk. Therefore, you don't need to be paid to develop the upstream part of it. It's about, okay, how much are you gonna get paid to, to really develop that facility, right? Whereas everywhere else, I mean, uh, for those of you who know, LNG facilities, liquefaction facilities, incredibly complex and expensive. And so that's why companies generally need, or countries, you know, like Qatar need a long-term uh, offtake agreement in order to be able to finance these, to have that surety that, okay, if we invest the tens of billions of dollars required for this project, and in particular develop this upstream project, which has its upstream risks, you know that we then have a guaranteed return on this uh, as much as as much as we can right given that obviously oil prices and everything move around um but again that's why it's different in the u.s where you can say all right we we can just buy this off the grid there is no upstream risk and really it's about just building the facility so it's a different model uh, so you mentioned uh, in passing henry hub uh, and, and let's talk sort of uh, benchmarks the, the majority of LNG contracts are index linked. Is the major benchmark for indexation still Brent, which uh, with my uh, limited knowledge basically expresses the cash settlement price, isn't it, for the Brent future? Uh, or will other benchmarks become more common, such as the one you mentioned, Henry Hub, TTL or JKM? Um, so I think, well, for a long time, really, the the key, key benchmark wasn't even really Brent. It was technically JCC, the Japanese crude cocktail, right? So because Japan was the biggest buyer and, you know, one of the big initiatives of the, the long distance LNG trade, right? And so and so it was indexed, uh, in a sense, off of, off of that, right? Over time, what we have seen exactly is that basically this is a Brent, uh, you know, lookalike JCC and Brent move, uh, you know, yeah. almost one, right? So now the question is, um, as you say, and, and the Japanese themselves were one of the groups who were pushing in the early sort of 2010s, right, to so 2011, 12, around that time to see, you know, with, with all the shale gas that's coming on the U.S., that perhaps it's better to, you know, we should see this convergence really, right, be, between the, the Henry Hub link prices and Brent link prices, right? Um, this was at a time where you can imagine, you know, if you think back to that time period, 2012 to 14, Brent yeah. prices were extraordinarily high, right, for that time. So they were well above 100, getting to 120, whereas um, Henry Hub was still, I think, around $5, but looked like it would be trending lower with all the new supplies coming on, right? So obviously, if you're a consumer, you're going to want to then try and get those two things to converge, right? Rather than paying the higher Brent price, you wanted to come down and be priced off of Henry Hub. Now, what we have seen is there has not been as much uptake on that, probably, as, as, as at least some buyers would have liked. And as you, you then said, we now have new markers such as JKM as well, right? Um, and that does serve now as a benchmark really in, uh, you know, in well, Asia. It, 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 my convoluted question is basically aimed at what drives a, a purchaser uh, of LNG to choose one uh, benchmark over another? Well, I think in, in the past it's been, well, we, we want security of supply, so we want to ensure, you know, so again, if you were Japan, you would that say- That must be the one, mustn't it? Sorry? 
that must be the number one security of supply. Uh, well, that's that's well. In the past, that's been it, right? But now, where you can have some economies that have a little bit more flexibility, right? Japan has to import all of its natural resources, just about at least on the energy side, right? China, for example, doesn't have that. India doesn't have that to the same degree, right? They have a few sectors that are a bit more price sensitive, and they can go up and down in terms of what they're using LNG or or perhaps something else, or they just see their demand reduce. So for them, it is a little bit more sometimes about what is the best best price. And even for Japan, again, as a consumer, they were looking at this occasionally, going, "Well, can we can we target price rather than security, right?" And especially at a time where, uh, again, if we think back to mid last decade, it felt like you know the supply was not at risk, was not constrained. Now, however, I think you look at it and you say, "Okay, you know, again, because of this underinvestment." That we're not seeing a lot of new LNG projects come on, where we're not seeing a lot of capacity come on, um, and now we need that new incentive pricing to come back in order to incentivize new projects, right? So then it becomes a question of okay, well, obviously the consumers are always going to want both security supply and、uh, the cheapest that they can get, right? But those two things don't always go together, and particularly if you're a producing nation who's looking at it, going, you know, I need to invest this much money, this much in particular of my own capital、uh, to deliver this. Therefore, I'm going to want obviously the highest return I can get from this. So you know, normally it's been a good way to meet in the middle, which is okay. We index this to, in fact, to something else. It's the only commodity that I know of that is actually priced against another commodity, right? But that seemed to have worked for a long time,、um, and now it's a question of okay, well, where do we go from here? Well, with these volatile markets, are they driving、um, buyers to seek longer-term deals? The reason I ask, I just seen that. Qatar Energy has signed a 27-year deal to supply China with LNG. Now that must be one of the longest、uh, LNG agreements、uh, so far. Yes, I think it is. Although I'm trying to think back, and、uh, that there may have been some signed again by Japan and others in sort of the 80s, perhaps, right? Which I know did last for a very long time.、Um, but that certainly is a long-term,、uh, you know, contract, a very long-term contract. And look, I would say.、Uh, It depends a little bit regionally, right? If you look at Europe right now, is saying、exactly. we want increased, increased, increase, you know,、um, yeah. But they're saying also that we want to transition away from fossil fuels as soon as we can, right? So, so they're again caught a little bit between this this impulse of this the driving impulse that they have to move away、uh, from fossil fuels, right? But in the meantime, to try and secure as much of it as they can in the short term, right?、Um, And so, you know, you saw some of the European countries come to to Qatar, for example, and say, "Look, you know, we want more LNG." And then they were told, "Okay, well, we need a long-term contract in order to be able to finance these facilities." And they're like, "Well, you know, we were thinking more, <laughs> more like five to seven years, which which obviously doesn't meet the requirements a little bit, right?" So it's how do you make these things match up? Yeah, and how, how do you make them balance? I mean, the demand and supply of gas that must be out of sync to a certain extent because of the reduction of gas supplies. Out of Russia to Europe, or are the current high prices due to the market seeking to maintain a balance? I mean, I think it's ultimately that, right? I think you you do have this vacuum that is formed because of the loss of, of Russian supplies, but you have been able to fill it because there is enough flexibility in the system. It doesn't mean that it has been painless.、Uh, that there are jurisdictions around the world that have seen their access to LNG be reduced quite significantly. I'm thinking of places in South Asia. Uh, parts of Africa as well, right? You know,、um, and it's not just LNG; it is across energy, right? Where where you have struggled sometimes because Europe is paying such a premium, and it hasn't been costless for for Europe by any means, right? They've had to spend significant amounts, uh, uh, you know, of money to to be able to secure the energy supplies that they have, but that we have been able to fill that at least for Europe, right?、Um, and other places, like I said, have have seen a reduction in their supplies. But so far, the global economy has continued to take over, right? And that 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 has not led to a major, major shutdown of of、uh, you know kind of economic. Now, now staying with Russia、uh, for、uh, at the moment, and and are Russian gas supplies discounting gas prices to sell excess supplies? Are, is Russia discounting its gas to sell?、Um, that doesn't appear to be the case. Partly because, unlike on oil, oil they can move around geographically, right? So if one place is not buying it, they can offer it at a discount and simply、yeah. ship it, right? But because of the way gas, you know, the, it has to be moved either by pipelines or LNG, and the pipelines are obviously a fixed route, a fixed asset, you know. 
So you can't then suddenly say, well, we're going we're gonna to shift our gas volume to go east to China, for example, right? Because you simply don't have the infrastructure. So rather than that, it appears that they have been, you know, uh, flaring quite a bit of the gas, uh, you know, and, and also just reducing, I think, production and, and putting it back in the, you know, keeping it in the reservoir or in storage. Are, are traders moving into in infrastructure investments such as storage and pipelines? Or is that sort of a, a, a predictable or normal expansion of their activities or is it all part of a new way of investing? I think we've always, you know, been uh, not focused on on storage and pipelines, but we do absolutely take on assets like that when when we believe that there's opportunity there, both for us and our peers. You know that that is uh, again, we would we would not say like the traditional oil and gas companies that we are looking to invest in those assets. But again, as opportunities come up, we do uh, mainly to be able to trade around those 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 positions. Um, and but I do think that because of the underinvestment from what I would call the traditional pools of capital, right? So the international oil companies, the national oil companies, and the banks, right? Across the energy value chain, um, you know, I mean, IOC, so international oil company spending is down by at least 50% of CapEx versus where it was in 2014. It's actually down by 60% if you include their clean energy spend, right? And yet prices are where they were and service sector costs are back to where they were, if not higher. Um, and so that has been a real loss of investment, right? And the oil market is about eight or nine million barrels a day bigger than it was then, right? So you're spending 60% less in a market that is, you know, eight, nine million barrels a day bigger and is costing more, right? So obviously there's a vacuum there that needs to be filled in terms of the investment. So what you are seeing is now, again, sort of, I would say more non-traditional pools of capital come in, whether it is private equity, whether it is sovereign wealth funds, or whether it is the trading companies, right? So we and, and Vital and a few others were invested in Russia's big oil field, Bostok, which is gonna be the next big oil project, simply because the world really needed that resource, right? Obviously once the war has happened, then we have, we have uh, gotten out of that as quickly as we can, but that you know, remains that there, need, there is this gap that has emerged between you know, longer term demand and supply, right? And so you are going to need to look to other people or other you know, institutions to try and fill that unless the traditional players come back in. OK, uh, let's um, ask the sixty four thousand dollar question uh, for the longer term. Asad, where is the world on course to reach that much vaunted, much talked about, especially over the last few weeks in Sham, much vaunted net zero emissions by 2050? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I think it depends on the region, but I think, you know, there's a lot of action that is being taken. But I think if you just look at the numbers, it seems like more probably needs to happen. My concern from where I said, because I'm not a, I'm not an expert on, the, um, on the, the net zero side or the climate side. Right. But for me, my concern is a little bit that because of the underinvestment in commodities in general, right, whether it is oil, gas or, or metals, is that you are running the risk in, uh, of prices in those sectors spiking at points and then in a sense cannibalizing the funds that you need for this energy transition this move towards net zero right and you know because it's it's hard to try and do both and then people you know really will focus on one or the other we always talk about it in a sense as a commodities transition because you do need to look at everything right um and and the worry is for example you know if we are very short oil capacity do we see a spike to 200 dollars or something at some point because of a lack of, of, of capacity again that is a burden on the world economy that is trying to spend its way to be able to move towards net zero right yeah. so that is a challenge i think and so from where we said that that's something that we have been very very vocal in public about and saying that you know there needs to be an all of the above approach to all of this we're not saying by any means spend less on energy transition and net zero in fact, if anything, you probably need to be spending more than you are right now, given some of the challenges, but that it needs to be married with a realistic understanding of how quickly you can move off of oil and gas. Right. Um, yes, that, that's the $64,000 question. How do you move out of fossil fuels? But um, last question, Saad, because you've been so articulate and so clear all the way through this podcast. What are the implications for LNG if net zero emissions are reached in 2050? And is the gas industry in investing quickly enough to prevent gas shortages? 
I think the implications will depend a little bit, you know, will be in a sense path dependent, right? How do we get to net zero, right? Is it, is it where we've gotten a breakthrough on the battery technology front and therefore we're able to just move towards renewables? Or is it some hybrid that we still need gas in power generation to be used as base load? Um, you know, so I think that will be very dependent, uh, you know, in that sense, and do the reductions then have to come from other parts of the of the chain, right? Um, and so I think depending on the answer to that question will depend a little bit then on how how much do we need to invest still from here. You know, my view on this has been that it has been proven very hard through history to move away from even fuels that you know you need to move away from. In a sense, if you look at coal, look at you know, Europe is burning I think probably a record amount of coal this year, even though it's reduced its coal capacity by 40% in the last three, four years, right? And that's really shows you that, okay, there, there was still some baseload that is there. But yeah, it's a good 2050, is, you know, but 2050, again, could it could vary a lot. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping a little bit for the planet's sake that there are some technological breakthroughs between now and then that allow us to really to, to get there. But, you know, again, uh, that, that remains to be seen. It's it's such a hard, hard question. I, I know with net zero and sustainability, one question leads to the possibility of about a dozen other questions. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, uh, unfortunately, we'll have to save those for another time. Um, Saad Rahim, many thanks for your views on how LNG trading works. It's been a fascinating discussion. The Foundation very much looks forward to speaking with you again in the future. And thank you all for listening. Be sure to keep up to date with the Alatia Foundation's publications and work by following us on Twitter and YouTube. From me, Stephen Cole, goodbye.